Okay, welcome. That's my cue to begin. My name is Chris Devers. I'm currently the CEO of Rancho Cielo and used to be the Senior uh, Director of Alternative Education with the Monterey County Office of Ed. I had the great privilege of starting Law Day um, with Honorable uh, Sam Lavarado five years ago. Um, it's turned into an incredible event. Um, all of the students here, uh, this is really about you. Um, we have some incredible uh, distinguished guests you're going to hear from today. Um, really a privilege and an honor to have the California Supreme Court Chief Justice come down, uh, all of our distinguished panel members, and of course uh, the Monterey County Superior Court judges. Um, on behalf of all the partners uh, who are involved in this project, uh, CSUMB, thank you for hosting the event. This is our first year doing it at CSUMB. Um, Hartnell uh, College, the Monterey County Office of Education, and the, <coughs> excuse me, the Monterey County Superior Court judges. Um, we, we formed a committee uh, that has worked all year long on making sure that this event happens. Um, I want to give a special thanks, so just right up front, I'll thank him again at the end, um, but Ben uh, James, he's working on his PhD at UC Santa Cruz. Let's give Ben, ben a big round of applause. <clears throat> Uh, this, this wouldn't have been possible uh, without Ben's uh, involvement. Uh, ben developed all the teacher resources that went out to uh, all the classrooms, and uh, you guys have been preparing uh, for this for three or four months now. Uh, but that was all Ben and the coordination uh, with the teachers, the students getting you here. Um, I also just want to kind of quickly highlight and give a very special thanks to Rhonda uh, from CSUMB and all your coordination. Let's give Rhonda a round of applause up front. <clears throat> Um, and then I want to I want to thank Emiliano Valdez uh, specifically from the Monterey County Arts Education Technology Group out of a MCOE uh, for going out and filming in the classrooms. You're going to see a short video on that today, and uh, for live streaming this so that students who can't be here have the opportunity to participate. And uh, this, uh, for the first time ever, will be documented so that we'll have this archived uh, forever. So let's give Emiliano a round of applause. And I want to. I want to thank our incredible AV team from CSUMB, uh, who you see over here in the booth, and they're the ones orchestrating this entire thing in this beautiful world theater. Let's give them a quick round of applause. And then, of course, uh, you'll hear me at the end, but I want to give a very special acknowledgement to the Dan and Lillian King Foundation. Uh, they're the ones who sponsor the prizes, which are significant uh, for the art and essay contest. And they're all the, uh, also the group that has sponsored the food. Uh, you'll be fed at the end of this event. Um, and after the event, uh, you'll have the opportunity to have lunch and go to a career fair. Uh, so I want to just uh, acknowledge them. And let's give the Dan and Lillian King Foundation a round of applause. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies today, and, um, and, and she is uh, such a trooper and a flexible player on this. Um, I was behind schedule with the entire script, and she's just jumped right into it and, and got her part nailed down, and she'll be running the entire show today. Uh, but I want to recognize and invite to the stage um, Superior Court Judge Pam Butler. The Honorable Pam Butler, as I just mentioned, is a Monterey County Superior Court judge. Um, she's currently serving as the presiding Superior Court judge, so that's the judge that is sort of the leader of all of the Monterey County Superior Court judges. Um, Honorable uh, Butler attended UC Santa Barbara, where fellow gauchos, and earned her law degree from uh, Southern Methodist University. Let's give another round of applause for the Honorable <laughs> Pam Butler. messed up and went off script and jumped the whole thing. And I've got to backtrack and I apologize for that. Um, and this is my bad. You have to be flexible in these types of things. But before we get into, and I'm, I'll reintroduce and invite uh, the Honorable Butler uh, back to the stage. Before we do that, I want to invite uh, Carlos Totres, our CSUMB music instructor, uh, to please lead us in the national anthem. If everybody uh, would please stand for this, um, we'd appreciate that. And let's welcome uh, Carlos Totres. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed 
At the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er oh, the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs burst in air Gay proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the And now we bring to the stage our Master of Ceremonies, the Honorable Pam Butler. Thank you. Wow, that was impressive. Good morning. Welcome to Law Day. It is wonderful to see this room filled with so many students who take an interest in the law and in the judicial process. Each year, the American Bar Association designates a theme to highlight an important issue relating to the law or the legal system celebrated throughout Law Day. In 1958, President Eisenhower proclaimed Law Day to honor the role of law in the creation of the United States of America. Law Day is a special day of celebration by the people of the United States, one in appreciation of their liberties and the reaffirmation of their loyalty to the United States and of their re dedication to the ideals of equality and justice under law in their relations with each other and with other countries, and two, for the cultivation of the respect for law that is so vital to the democratic way of life. This year's Law Day theme is toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change. The Constitution is a dynamic document as it not only outlines a blueprint for government, but also delegates power, articulates rights, and offers mechanisms for change. It is neither perfect nor exhaustive, as our nation's history makes clear. Legislation, court rulings, amendments, lawyers, and we, the people, have built upon those original words across generations to attempt to make the more perfect union more real. That effort continues today as contemporary leaders and everyday citizens raise their voices as loud as ever to fulfill the promise of the Constitution, defining and refining those words of the Constitution might be our oldest national tradition and how each of us works together toward a more perfect union. At this time, I am pleased to introduce the president of CSUMB, Dr. Eduardo Ochoa. Dr. Ochoa grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina, before moving to Portland, Oregon, where he earned degrees in physics, nuclear science, and economics from Reed College, Columbia University, and the New School for Social Research, respectively. He completed his master's at Columbia University in New York in nuclear science and engineering. He received his PhD in economics at the New School for Social Research in graduate school. In February 2010, President Barack Obama named Dr. Ochoa Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education. And I believe we're gonna see a video. Good morning. I am CSUMB President Eduardo Choa, and I am pleased to welcome you to this event. It is wonderful to have so many of you on campus today, both in the World Theater and University Center. 
Law Day is a way for students to learn about careers in the legal profession. I hope that each of you enjoy hearing from our speakers and learn more information about this career path. As local Monterey County high schoolers making the choice about colleges in the near future, I would like to mention that at CSUMB, we offer a pre-law minor that is part of our human communication major. Our program provides access to and knowledge about the law, which is an important part of being an active and engaged community member. This year, we are fortunate to have the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, Tani Kantil Sakawye, as one of our speakers. We welcome her and the remarks she will provide. Honorable Kantil Sakawye is the first Asian Filipino American and the second woman to serve as the state's Chief Justice. Chief Justice Kantil Sakawye chairs the Judicial Council of California which is the administrative policymaking body of state courts and the Commission on Judicial Appointments. I hope you are inspired by her words today and perhaps someday a future president of CSUMB may welcome you to speak in a similar role. Thank you and enjoy Law Day at CSUMB. I am also pleased to introduce the Monterey County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Deneen Gus. Dr. Deneen Gus was sworn in as the Monterey County Superintendent of Schools on January 7, 2019, and is now serving her first term of office. Dr. Gus continually supports Monterey County's 24 local school districts and the 78,000 students they serve. And I think we're going to see another video. Good morning and welcome to Law Day 2022. I'm Dr. Deneen Gus, Monterey County Superintendent of Schools. I'm so excited that we have so many students, educators, colleagues, elected officials, and our friends from the law community here with us today. It's going to be a great day of learning together. Many thanks to CSUMB for hosting this year's event and to all of the committee members who worked behind the scenes for many, many months to put today's program together for all of us. Law Day is so important because it gives us the opportunity to learn more about our democracy, civic law, the history of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and so much more. This year's 2022 Law Day theme toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change certainly touches on how our Constitution has evolved over time and how this document has become flexible to our needs so that we can advance in directions that keep us united and growing as a nation. There are hundreds of students from throughout Monterey County in the audience today, both in person and some participating virtually. I applaud you all for taking part in this unique learning experience and immersing yourself in a day of civic learning. I hope you will find time to connect with your fellow students and our presenters to uncover ways in which you can support forming a more perfect union. You will be hearing from some very prominent local civic leaders today, and I'm certain you will gain great insight and knowledge from each one of them as they talk about their careers and why the judicial system is so important to our society, please listen carefully. I encourage you to dig deep in today's lessons. Advance your understanding of how our world is changing and how the Constitution guides the branches of our government in their everyday actions to meet our ever-changing needs. Once again, I would like to give a shout out to CSUMB for hosting this year's event and to all of the community partners who helped to make this event possible. I also want to do a special shout out to Judge Sam Lavarado. He has been the inspiration behind this annual event since its inception several years ago. I'm hopeful that all of you will leave today's event understanding more about our democracy, the importance of our legal process, and how our Constitution has evolved over the years to form a more perfect union. 
Have a wonderful day of learning at Law Day 2022. As part of our exciting array of Law Day content for students, teachers, and our community members, some of our local teachers teamed up with California State University Monterey Bay Law students to explore some of the topics and lessons around the 2022 Law Day theme. The theme this year is Toward a More Perfect Union, the Constitution in Times of Change. In this video, you can see one of these amazing collaborative lessons with the talented students of North Salinas High School and their equally talented teacher, Megan Pedersen. Today, you're going to think about some moments in your life when you've acted like a judge and made an important decision that affected others. You're going to create a list of qualities and duties you think are necessary to be a good judge. Then we're going to actually read some excerpts. Excerpts means little pieces, little parts of the US Constitution and the California State Constitution. Remember yesterday we talked about how they're different, how we have a US Constitution for the whole country and then we have one just for our state of California. Um, and then we'll see if we get to the end, we're going to write a thesis statement about what does it take to be a judge. And then over here, Noah was gonna share his with us too. It's pretty different. So listen closely to what Noah has to say. They try to find the person, but they really can't because they don't know who it was. So they just decided to change my password instead. There you go. Thanks for sharing. It's a good, a good one thinking about, well, when should we bring something to an authority figure or when should we handle it on our own? The person who's going to come is, chief, is the Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, which is not as high as the U.S. Supreme Court, but still a very, very, very high, very powerful position. And you'll be writing questions, hopefully, for her. And so how did your friends judge you? Like, why did I keep you there? Yeah. I should have done it lighter. Yeah. Are they giving you a hard time? No. No, that's good. They're good friends. And then someone else reads the, um, reads the decision that the judge made to the um, rest of the court. Ms. Pedersen collaborated with CSUMB law student Janelle Watkins and Monterey County Office of Education event coordinator Ben James to put together a lesson on state and federal judiciaries in preparation for this Law Day. Students discussed and debated what it means to be a judge. They explored primary source documents on state and Supreme Court justices and wrote questions for today's keynote speaker, Chief Justice Tani Kantil Sakayue and the other esteemed panel members here today. Thank you once again to Ms. Pedersen, Janelle Watkins from CSUMB, the students of North Salinas High School, and of course, to all of the teachers and students across Monterey County for your hard work and dedication to engaging in these important issues and for exploring what it takes to keep working toward making our country a more perfect union. And now, it is both an honor and a pleasure to introduce Tani Kantil Sakauye, the 28th Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. Governor Schwarzenegger stated that nominating Chief Justice Kantil Sakauye was one of the most important decisions he ever made in office, describing her as a fine public servant. In accepting the nomination, she personally expressed a commitment to being mindful of the public trust and specifically to learn from the past, to address the immediate needs and the priorities of the present, and to plan and prepare for the future. For the past 11 years, she has earned that trust. She is tireless in her efforts to exceed the requisite duties of her position. She strenuously supports the judges and the courts, making sure necessary resources are available for courts to operate effectively and expeditiously. I have not spoken to a single judge in the state of California who has not had the opportunity to meet her or to hear her speak in person. As she is today, she is accessible, 
and enthusiastic about promoting the judges and the courts. I tried initially to list her accomplishments and we would be here all day. Summarizing them, we would be here at least half a day. So I chose one thing that as a judge, in my humble personal opinion, that is perhaps her most extraordinary accomplishment. Many of you don't know, but her passion is for access to justice. And that passion is legendary amongst the courts and the judges. She has given that phrase meaning. It defines her vision. It has also become a goal that has been adopted by all courts, all judges, all court employees. And if you can get all those different people with their different preferences to get behind an idea, that is unheard of. Her philosophy has instilled in each of us a greater awareness of what we are doing in our professional lives, individually and collectively. It has unified all judges, and it serves as a constant reminder to each of us to strive harder, to remember that each case, each litigant, each victim, each witness deserves the ability to have access to justice. And with that, Justice Tani Cantil Sakuye. Good morning. I want to first uh, thank CSUMB for offering us this forum, to thank uh, Dr. Ochoa for his kind introduction, Dr. Uh, Gus for her enthusiasm and clear passion for teaching and all of you students, and also to presiding Judge Butler for that kind and generous introduction, and a special shout out to Judge Sam Lavarado for inspiring this outreach and to all of the judges in the Monterey County Courts because of the work they do every day to achieve justice for you, for your families, for your community, and for your future. I also want to say here today that I'm proud that it's Law Day, and I'm really excited, honestly, that it's about the Constitution because all of us, judges, senators, assembly members, governors, presidents, Congress presidents, we all raise our hand at the beginning of our administration and we swear the oath. And the oath of office for all of us is that we will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And enemies might be, you think of in terms of war or you think in terms of other countries. But enemies of the Constitution can be laws that are unconstitutional. It can be oppression of people. It can be bias. It can be discrimination. It can be the elimination of rights. And judges who swear this oath in particular have to have the vision to be able to see that, apply the rule of law to ensure equity and fairness and equality in the application of law. And so today on Law Day, I thought I'd like to bring to life for you a little bit about the Constitution, because I am not a Constitution nerd, but my background, I'm the daughter of farm workers, I went to a community college, and if I were to trace back the abilities and the opportunities that I have had, it is because of our charter, the law that is embodied in the California Constitution and the US Constitution. So well before the US Constitution was even an idea, we were a subject of Britain, and we wanted to separate from this superpower because they were oppressing us, taxing us, not giving us our rights, as you well know. So first, well before the Constitution, came the Declaration of Independence. And as you may not know, if you signed the Declaration of Independence, it was a death warrant on your head. Because in those days, before we were a nation, before there was the Constitution, 
there was circulated a petition to see who would stand against Britain. Well, of the states that existed at the time, a third signed, a third said, no way, and the other third said, well, let's wait and see what happens to the third that signed. So creating this country was not a unanimous, rousing decision. It was one of concern and one of fear. Thereafter, after a war against the superpower by a ragtag team of farmers and uh, workers and laborers and uh, some statespersons, soldiers, we, against all odds, beat a superpower. This is if you took some country in some part of the world and it went up against uh, Britain now. We didn't have in those days, in the 1700s, the kind of force and resources. In fact, the country, the United States as it was known then, went into deep debt over a war only to win the victory of being free. And once we were free, our framers said, now what do we do? Now what do we do? We are a country. And so the Constitution was created. The Constitution was created by farmers and scholars, regular people who thought that we do not need nor want a king, a lifetime king to rule us. We don't need royalty. Royalty is no better than we are. We need to be a beacon of hope as a country that shows that we can rule ourselves. We can create the more perfect union. The people can create the more perfect union. And so our framers, and there are approximately under 50 of them, they collectively decided to try to write a constitution. They borrowed from some of the colonies that had had charter documents. They also put most of the writing up to James Madison. But these were people who heavily edited each other's work. Think if you got together with 27 of your friends and you decided to create a club and you needed to create rules for the club. That's what was happening in the creation of this constitution. It took many, many people, and some of them are known to you and they're famous to you. People like uh, Benjamin Franklin, the oldest of the framers. This framer was, so, was a person who was basically a business person. Uh, he started post offices to make money. Then he franchised them and became rich. And then in his idle time decided that he would be a diplomat to France and to the United States to help create and edit the Constitution. The same is true, as you know, of Alexander Hamilton, who was the only framer who was non-white, who did not and was not born on US soil. Uh, we also know across the board uh, that these men had left their homes and put their businesses and their farms in the hands of their wives. So the first ladies, the first women, were also important because they did the work at home that allowed the men to go to the Continental Congress. And the Constitution itself was merely a negotiated document. They didn't sing praises. They didn't say it was great. They was, at this point, it was like, well, this is good enough. Let's start. This is good enough. And then they took it to, the, to be ratified, as you know, to the then 13 states. And the 13 states said, no, no, wait a minute. No, no, wait a minute. We're not signing up for another Britain. We're not signing up for another big government to run us. We want certain rights. We want protections. We want protection from you, whatever you're going to be in the future. And so that's how the Bill of Rights came about. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution was sort of a negotiated deal. The states were not willing to sign off and ratify the Constitution until in a negotiation they got protection from it. That's why the First Amendment exists. And it's funny that it's the First Amendment. The First Amendment of the Bill of Rights to ratify the Constitution is freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of religion, and that government not establish a religion that all of us have to be a part of. So if you look at the first 10 amendments that, gave, that paved the way for the ratification of the Constitution, you will see that all of it was protection against government. All of it was basically anti-British oppression. So I tell you this background because who would know that after the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, that 234 years later, 
all of those framers would even think to know that North Salinas High School and Everett Alvarez High School and Monterey and the judges in the County Office of Education would be here to celebrate it. They, the founders didn't even know people like us. They, they never even saw people like us. Because the truth is, at least in those times, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, was written for propertied white men. That's just history. I, we can't do anything about that, but we've certainly evolved. But the point is, is the Constitution is a living thing. Look at it now. We're talking about toward a more perfect union. That's for us. Uh, it, we're talking about the Constitution in times of change. The Constitution is always changing, either by constitutional amendment, which doesn't happen very often, which is why we only have 27 amendments to the United States Constitution. But we have the changes in the Constitution through the interpretation by the courts, through the interpretation by the United States Supreme Court, the federal courts, and the state courts. And has already been mentioned, our California state constitution was inspired by the US Constitution. And to make it really simple, just know this. The California Constitution contains every, uh, every right, just about, that the United States Constitution has. So there's similar documents. But the California Constitution protects you even more, protects you even more in California, because that's our right as a state towards the federal government that was written in the Bill of Rights to protect the states from federal government. So I tell you all this because absent the Constitution and absent the Bill of Rights and absent the case law that developed and absent, uh, I would say, mentors and absent people who saw into the future, I would never be the Chief Justice of California. I'm the first non-white person as the Chief Justice of California. And California is 172 years old. So let me tell you that uh, I, I may be the first, but I know definitely for certain I am not the last. And the second and third and fourth and fifth may be in this room. And I say that because where you are now and what you're learning from your teachers and the adults in your life who are trying to give you the foundation to make you better and stronger and just to learn and just to absorb are really priming you to be able to stick up for your own rights and the rights of others, to fully take advantage of your rights and your constitution. And the judicial branch is here to ensure that the rights are evenly and equally applied. That's what we as judges do. That's what we have devoted our lives to. And all of us were previously lawyers. So in those days, we took sides as lawyers. And we sought to win for our side. But now that we're judges, we take no side. We stand on the side of the Constitution and the rule of law, and that is to protect and defend the Constitution and apply the law evenly and fairly to what? Provide a more perfect union. And a more perfect union means more equality. It also means a discussion of equity. But equity, which I translate as fairness, so equality is equal. That's pretty simple to decide. We have 100%. We have one pie. Equal means I get 50%, you get 50%. There's four of us, right? We divide the pie. Equal is something we all conceptually understand and accept. But equity, which we hear more and more about today, is less about equality and more about fairness. And fairness is in the eye of the beholder. Fairness depends on the situation. And that's where judges make a decision based on multiple factors as to whether equity applies and to what extent equity should apply and for how long. And that's going to be a question for your generation and also for your future leaders in terms of how we move toward a more perfect union. Because moving toward a more perfect union nowadays is not just equality. It's more than that. And you're being taught that and you're learning that. And that's part of what we're doing here today. And before I conclude my formal remarks and uh, provide hopefully some Q&A, I do want to do a shout out to many people. First, to Everett Alvarez for winning the 2020 Civics Excellence Award brought by the Judicial Council. To uh, Gabriela Manzo from this area, who was our former uh, champion of civics. And to Jennifer Elliman, who was her champion by nominating her because we can all be champions of each other and sponsors of each other by supporting each other. 
and by making sure that we can lift each other up where we can in order to provide a more perfect union, a more perfect environment, a more perfect life for you and success. So I thank you for the time, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here at Law Day and to address all of you because you are the future. Thank you. So I heard that your, one of your instructors talked about preparing questions for me. I don't know what those questions are, but I'll do my best to answer them if you would like to start that portion. Um, good morning, Chief Justice. My name is Juana Gomez. Wave from, to me. Wave to me. Where are you? From North Salinas High School. Hi. Good morning. And my question for you is, um, what was the most important thing that helped you become a judge? Thank you. What was the most important thing that helped me become a judge? Uh, my mother. And I say that with all honesty. Uh, my mother had a high school education, and she was a farm worker. And we were part of the Filipino community. And she took me to see the first ever uh, female lawyer that the community had ever heard of. So all of us gathered in Sacramento at a hall, and we were in the audience. And this female lawyer, her name was uh, Gloria... Ochoa, uh, Manigno Ochoa, came to speak to us. And we had never seen any Filipina with so much education in our community. And I was sitting with my mother, and she elbowed me really hard, and she said, you could do that. And I didn't know what it was, but I remember how much my mother thought that that was important. And, you know, our parents are our earliest influencers, and they never leave our head. And so for me... The first thought of ever becoming a lawyer uh, became, was my mother, who also had lots of other ideas, but that idea was the first one that got me thinking about the law and justice. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Justice. My name is Maya Barba from Everett Alvarez High School, and my question for you is, have you experienced any challenges trying to get to where you're at, especially as a woman of color? Thank you. Have I experienced any challenges uh, to get where I am as a woman of color, a person of color? I'll say absolutely. I have faced challenges not only as a woman, but also um, as an Asian woman, and also as being sort of small compared to everyone else size-wise in the courtroom. And, um, you know, being a person of color in, uh, was also, I looked younger in the old days than what I really was. So everywhere I went as a young lawyer, I was asked, uh, would you file this? Would you go get me a cup of coffee? Uh, what grade are you in? What college are you going to? When are you going to pass the bar? And I, by this time, I was at least seven years in as a lawyer. Um, so I had challenges, too, early on, because I became a lawyer in 1984, and I was a prosecutor, so I was doing trials. And I would work primarily with, against a male defense attorneys, and male defense attorneys would always interrupt me and always talk over me. And so pretty soon I learned that I had to interrupt them and yell at them and then pretty soon, they stopped doing it. Um, and then pretty soon, judges would call for greater order in the courtroom because two lawyers are yelling at each other. Um, so I will say that was not my upbringing. I grew up in a large Filipino family, and I was the youngest. And I hardly ever argued with anyone, and I hardly ever fought with anyone. And so I wasn't... Uh, exactly had the skills to be in a courtroom, but I learned them very quickly. And I learned that there are abilities you have yet that you don't even know about because you haven't had to use them. But yes, there are challenges. Even today, I travel pretty extensively and I travel nationally. And other states are just not used to seeing uh, uh, a small Asian woman in charge of California's judiciary. And there are strange challenges. And uh, in the beginning, too, people would not call me the chief justice. They would just call me the lady. 
So you, you, do, you do it with a sense of humor and you try to learn a lesson and you try not to become angry or bitter because if you are angry or bitter, what's the saying? You're taking the poison, but you're hoping someone else will die. So there's no reason to pollute yourself with those ill feelings because you're only going to hurt yourself. So try to have some humor, learn from it, and try to share it with good people who will make you forget it. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Justice. Um, my name is Kaylee Perez, and I'm from North Salinas High School. And my question for you is, with the knowledge that you have now, as you look back, what advice would you give to your younger self? Thank you. What advice would I give to my younger self? I would say this, and that is, don't feel overly pressurized. Don't feel overly pressed to accomplish great things and fantastic things at your age. But I would say do this, build your brand. And that is only you can make the best you. And so that means read, listen to your teachers, try new things, read new things, read current events, read several descriptions of the current event so you can have your own opinion. Learn to be your own thinker. Learn to have your own opinion. Don't just accept what people tell you. Uh, become a critical thinker. I would also say, too, that there will be hard times, and the best you can do about a hard time is to get through it and then look back and find the greatest parts of it that make you better and flush the rest. Because you can, you're in charge of you, and don't let other people take that power from you. So you need to build the best you, and you can learn from others, but remember your goal is to build the best you. So that means absorbing information, listening to other people, trying new things when you can in your time, uh, learning as much as you can, even about the strangest, most arcane things. You'd be surprised. And, and take jobs, because no job is without honor, and, and learn the best from it. And I give you an example. I, um, I waited tables all through college, and I waited tables at night. And I learned that people are really irritable and um, demanding and a little irrational. And I learned that when they're angry at me, uh, they're not, they don't know me. How can they be angry at me? So I just learned to tolerate bad behavior because it's not personal and because you get better at it. And then later on, I learned as a lawyer and as a judge, that really helps to tolerate bad behavior because you see a lot of it. Uh, because in a courthouse, in a courtroom, the people who are at the sides, the parties in front of you, are in conflict. They have a problem, and they want you to solve it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. So I think you need to build your foundation, and you need to look for positives from what you can learn from difficult challenges. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello and good morning, Ch Chief Justice. My name is Knox and I'm from North Salinas High School. My question is, what does a more perfect union mean to you? Thank you. I love that question too. What does a more perfect union mean to me? Well, first I would say it's aspirational, meaning I don't think we'll ever get to perfect. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to strive for perfection. And that means doing good things, bringing people along, making the world better, even our own little worlds that might exist in our home, in our bedroom, in our backyard, making it better to the best that we can. And I think the union part means moving toward a per more perfect union is understanding how diverse we are, understanding how we should celebrate our differences instead of tolerate them. I, I also really marvel at the fact that the United States is the only country in the world that is as diverse as we are. And I think that's a strength to our union. 
because we learn more about each other. Uh, we begin to appreciate and understand history. Uh, we become more compassionate. We can find new hobbies. So I, I tend to think um, moving toward a more perfect union is understanding that there'll always be work to do. We can always be better. We can always get to perfect or strive for it. Um, and a union means a union. If we founded this country on the belief that everyone here is welcome and that we have opportunities, then I think the union part means let's stop othering each other. Let's start appreciating each other. Thank you. Chief Justice, thank you very much for all your words and answering all the questions. That's our last question. Let's give one more round of applause for the students' questions and our Chief Justice of California. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for Honorable this Honorable Butler, we're going to continue with the program and start move to the next section. I assure you I'm not as petite as she is, so um, I would like to thank, and that was extraordinarily inspirational, not only the comments, but her answers to the questions of our Chief Justice. It is such an honor to have someone of her caliber come and talk to us about her experiences and stories. I would now like to introduce six highly regarded members of the legal profession and of our community here in Monterey County. Please join me in welcoming Honorable Julie R. Culver, Judge of the Monterey County Superior Court. The Honorable Julie Culver took her oath as a judge on April 30th, 2015. She is currently assigned to the Civil Probate Department, was previously in the Felony Criminal Department and serves in the Judicial Council Information Technology Advisory Committee and the Policy Subcommittee. Judge Culver. <coughs> we also are joined by Sheriff Steve Bernal. He was elected to the Office of Sheriff in November of 2014 before being elected as the 31st Sheriff of Monterey County, Sheriff Bernal was assigned as a patrol deputy at the South County Station. Sheriff Bernal started his career as a custody deputy at the jail, where his duties also included bailiff duties and transportation duties. Thank you, Sheriff Bernal. We are joined by Janine Pacioni, our district attorney. Janine Pacioni is the district attorney representing and in charge of the Monterey County District Attorney's Office. She has worked in a variety of site assignments previously as a deputy district attorney, including sexual assault, adult sexual assault, juvenile gang, child sexual assault, elder abuse, and human trafficking. Thank you for being here also, District Attorney Pacioni. <laughs> we also have Jeremy Zubai, Chief Deputy Public Defender. Chief Deputy Public Defender Zubai is the Chief Assistant Public Defender for Monterey County. His entire legal career has been spent defending people in criminal and immigration proceedings. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we are joined by Lisa Cisneros, Deputy Attorney General. Deputy Attorney General Lisa Cisneros is a Deputy Attorney General with the California Office of the Attorney General, Civil Rights Enforcement Section. Thank you again for coming. We forgot, uh, we have one more panel member, 
and I'll introduce him. Um, this is my fault for the notes not being here. Forgive me, please. Do you have it? Okay. Now, last but not least, um, we are joined by Chief Probation Officer Todd Keating. Chief Probation Officer Todd Keating is a graduate of North Salinas High School and Hartnell Community College, later went on to Fresno State University with a BS in criminology. He has been with the Monterey County Probation Department for 31 years as a Deputy Probation Officer, Supervisor, Director, assistant chief and chief. He's worked in both the adult and juvenile divisions at every level throughout his career and also coached high school track and field for the past 13 years. Thank you for joining us. So I know many of the people here, many of the students may be considering a career in law or government. So we are gonna ask that each member of our panel take a few minutes to share a little about themselves and to describe the career path they took that brought them here, but we also want to leave enough time for the students to ask questions, which I feel is so informative and what they're interested in hearing from you. Let's start with Judge Culver. Good morning. Um, I am Judge Julie Culver. I went to law school, as um, every judge does before they um, become a judge. I then practiced law in the Monterey County District Attorney's Office, where I was a prosecutor for 14 years. After that, I was a private lawyer doing corporate work for 10 years, and I have been on the bench, which means that I've been a judge for 11 years now. I was sworn in, as Judge Butler said, in 2010. So that's the path that I've taken. As I say before, or as you may know, before you become a lawyer, you have to go to college and then to three years of law school. Sheriff Bernal. Hi, Sheriff Steve Bernal. I grew up in South Monterey County, King City, and uh, I went to Hartnell College after high school, and while I was attending Hartnell College, I was also working for my father, who was an ag pilot here in the Salinas Valley, and I, was taking flying lessons at the time and I was offered a job uh, to follow in my father's footsteps in the ag flying business. So I, I learned how to fly airplanes and helicopters and I was in the ag flying business in the Salinas Valley for about 10 years. Uh, I also had an interest in law enforcement at the, when I had just graduated from high school and I took criminal justice courses going to Hartnell, but I still had a passion for flying and I followed that passion, uh, but I still had that inside of me. I wanted to be involved in law enforcement. So after 10 years of ag flying, I decided to change careers and I applied with the Department of Corrections and I applied with the Sheriff's Office and I was lucky enough to get picked up by the Sheriff's Office before the Department of Corrections and I, uh, that, that has been a good path for me. I was a deputy sheriff for uh, 17 years before I decided uh, I wanted to run for sheriff. And I, uh, I went around and asked a lot of people before I ran for sheriff about the job first and if I was able to, to do that job, if I, if I had what it took to, to be the sheriff of Monterey County. And after talking to several people who have done this job, I convinced myself I can do it and I ran for sheriff. And, uh, but the path I took to this profession is not a usual path. I, I recommend, you know, more college, more, you know, uh, education before you get here. Um, but um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you. I think I am. One's enough. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Janine Paccioni, Monterey County District Attorney. I actually started off um, being a flight attendant, going to flight attendant school for American Airlines. And uh, when I was in school for that the, in Dallas, Texas, um, discovered uh, near graduation time that I was not excited about actually that career at all. And uh, so I quit 
Uh, before I graduated, I came back into college, uh, so I am a flight attendant school dropout. But um, went back to college, didn't know I was going to go to law school, didn't, I just needed to get my degree. I figured I didn't have a job and I didn't have a degree, so I should go to college and finish that up. And as I was doing that, um, I became interested in law. Uh, I thought law school would be a good choice for me and um, entered into a law school and enjoyed that experience about just learning about <clears throat> how our, our process in the law, f the functions of it. So um, tried different things when I was in law school. I tried working for a personal injury firm. I tried working for an insurance defense firm. I even interned at a public defender's office, and none of those were a good fit for me. Uh, my last year of law school, I ended up interning at the DA's office and um, was able to put on preliminary hearings in court in front of a judge and admit evidence into court, and it was exciting and um, thrilling, and I, it was just uh, an, an instant fit for me. So when I graduated law school, I immediately went into a DA's office in Kern County um, as was a prosecutor there for two years before moving to Monterey. Um, I was a prosecutor in Monterey for um, 10 years and then um, had uh, three kids in three years. I had a set of twins, so <laughs> I get a break there. Um, and I ended up staying home then for eight years with my kids, so I stopped prosecuting altogether and um, stayed home with my family for eight years. And when the kids were back, were in school full time, I ended up coming back to the DA's office and then um, promoting from within the office by my predecessor, Dean Flippo, who was the Monterey County DA for 28 years. And then when he retired, I ran uh, for my seat and I was elected in 2018 and took the seat in 2019. Right. And Chief Public Defender Jeremy Zubai. Uh, I grew up in a town of 747 people in rural Wisconsin. And when I was a junior in high school, um, the, the town had one police officer, Gary. <laughs> and when I was a junior, Gary was dating one of my classmates. This is rural Wisconsin. But anyway, um, the, the girl he was dating, I found very annoying. And I must have said something to her because for a period of about two months, I got pulled over by Gary um, every night as I drove home from school. And I would be handcuffed, put in the back of the squad car, and told how I should be nicer to his girlfriend. And, and uh, that had an impact on and um, I decided at that point that I was going to go to law school and I was going to defend people against uh, the government. And uh, I went to law school. Before law school, I taught high school to save up money for law school, taught uh, chemistry and math, and uh, then went to law school. And ever since then, I have been a criminal defense attorney. Um, it's been extremely rewarding. I, I love what I do. It's very exciting and I would highly recommend it um, to you all. Chief Probation Officer, I'm sorry, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Cisneros. Thank you. Um, I grew up here in Monterey County, um, initially over in North Salinas. I went to La Jolla Elementary and um, then my family moved to the south side. Um, I graduated from Berkeley in, in uh, Berkeley Law School in 2007, and I had a really uh, wonderful opportunity to come back to Salinas to work with an organization called California Rural Legal Assistance. And um, they've got an office in East Salinas, and my colleagues um, primarily um, provided free legal assistance um, to the community for people facing a variety of legal problems, um, such as not being paid full wages, um, you know, being shorted hours if they were working in the fields, or um, being denied rest or meal breaks. Uh, they also 
uh, did eviction defense and um, represented students um, in disciplinary proceedings if they were being expelled from school. So all of these services were uh, provided for free and um, I was just really excited for the opportunity to come back home. Um, it was helpful that I was able to uh, move in with my mom and, and save on housing costs and uh, pay student loans and more easily in that way, but um, it was just a perfect fit and I actually had an initial assignment to start a new program with CRLA focused on LGBTQ plus rights. Um, so this is 2007 and California, um, unlike many other states, actually was a leader in recognizing basic civil rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And the organization which had offices not only in Salinas, but throughout the state, primarily in Central Valley, but also on the Central Coast, wanted to provide better legal services to LGBT people. And um, I came out as a teenager um, in Salinas, and in law school I had the opportunity to learn about this area of law, which was really um, evolving very quickly. And so um, that was my primary responsibility um, so it really gave me an opportunity as a civil rights attorney to, um, you know, cut my cut my teeth and learn how to represent um, LGBT people and folks, um, um, low income folks in general, and immigrants, uh, farm workers, and just a, a wide range of communities who sometimes experience um, exploitation of their um, basic civil rights or workers' rights or what have you. So um, it was a great um, organization to work for, and I did eventually, though, um, take a break because I was interested in working um, with a judge because I wanted to better understand how judges make their decisions. And so I had the opportunity to work with a federal judge for two years in Oakland, and um, so I went from being an advocate to um, being part of the federal bench and, and uh, neutral in, in the process. And it was a great learning experience because even though I had a law degree and I had practiced for a few years, there's nothing like um, working with a judge and understanding um, the, the nuts and bolts of their proce process and their perspective of uh, weighing all, all sides of a case, uh, really like closely scrutinizing facts and so forth. So, Anyhow, I did that, and then I went and worked for um, a big firm in San Francisco um, where we primarily did large class actions. So these are types of cases that are often brought a bit, uh, uh, um, against major corporations. Um, so we uh, sued a variety of corporations, Google, Apple, and so forth, for um, violation of workers' rights and antitrust law. And I did that for a few years, and then I, I really missed um, Salinas and Monterey County, so I actually came back um, with my wife and two kids and uh, practiced here for another four years until um, I was invited, uh, extended an offer by the Attorney General um, uh, for the state of California to join their civil rights enforcement section. Um, so this was in 2019, and at that point I had um, a lot of skills in the courtroom and also with respect to LGBT rights and immigration rights. And so I went um, to represent the state of California through the Attorney General's office um, on a variety of cases related to health care, to immigration rights, um, you know, LGBT rights, and so forth. So it's been a really exciting career that I, where I feel like I've been able to give back uh, to my community, to, um, to Salinas, to Monterey County, and also um, you know, work in an area of law that has a lot of personal impact for, for me and my family. Chief Probation Officer Todd Keating. Good morning, everyone. Um, after I left North Salinas High School and got to Hartnell College, all I really cared about was sports. And so I played football, ran track, and I had no, really no um, idea of what I wanted to do. Maybe I'd be a teacher. My, my dad was a, a coach and teacher growing up, so I thought maybe I would go that route. But 
Um, by the time I got to Fresno State, I, I decided you know, I need to figure out what I'm going to do. I still really had no clue, but one of my professors was a probation officer with uh, Fresno County Probation. And I really enjoyed his class, which was like a criminology 101 class or something like that. Um, but just his perspective and the way he approached things, you know, he, he kind of reminded me of, of myself, the way I approached things. And so I decided I was going to be a probation officer. I was fortunate enough to come back to Salinas and get hired. And, you know, it's really been a perfect fit. Um, I'm really, it's been a privilege to, to work for the county for, I'm on 31 years now as, as a probation officer. And, um, yeah, it, it worked out. <laughs> Right, and I think it's time for the, pan the students to ask the panel some questions. Um. Good morning, panel members. My name is Jose Waza Marquez. I'm from North Salinas High School, and my question for you today is, what's the most challenging thing about your job and why? Jose, thank you for asking the question. As I mentioned, I'm a judge here on the Superior Court. For 10 years, I served as a judge in the criminal courts, and I'll tell you that some of the hardest days that I ever had were the days where victims' families would come before me and tell me about their daughter that they lost because of a drunk driver, or their son that they lost because of a shooting or one of their other family members. It was hard because I could feel their pain. I knew that they would never forget the day that they heard about losing their family member, and there was nothing I could do about that. I could offer them my comments. I could let them know that their family would be there to take care of them. I could let them know that someone was going to jail or prison but it was never gonna bring their family member back. So those are the challenges and those are the hard days that I've had. Thank you, Jose. Thank you for the question, Jose. And there's just, I'm trying to think of one big challenge. There's been so many challenges in this job and in my life, really. And to think of one, I would have to say, when I changed careers, when I went from being a pilot to going into law enforcement, the reason I went into law enforcement was because I wanted to be a deputy sheriff. I wanted to patrol the rural parts of the county. I didn't want to be confined to a city. I wanted to be a deputy sheriff out in the, out in the county area. Uh, but in Monterey County, when I first got hired, you have to work in the jail. And I really had to convince myself that this is what I really wanted to do because being confined in the jail as a jail deputy, it's, it's, sometimes that's, that's not why you became a cop but it's something you have to adapt to, and I had to convince myself this is really what I wanted to do. Eventually, this is my path to get out on the road into a patrol car and patrol the county area. And I had to do that for about three years before I, I was able to get into a patrol car and patrol, but just being uh, working in the jail and, and trying to adapt to that part of law enforcement was difficult for me, and I had to keep convincing myself uh, it's all going to be worth it in the end. And it was. It was after working in the jail for three years, it was a learning experience uh, that most people don't realize. It's, you know, they become cops because they want to patrol the streets. But working through the jail and learning, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing in a confined area with people that you're going to be dealing with out in the street. So it was really a good learning experience when I look back on it. So something something that you... You know, the path to where you want to go is not always easy, but you always learn from it, and I did. So that's probably one of the biggest challenges I had. You know, similar to Judge Culver, um, in the DA's office, we deal with victims um, or witnesses that have gone through th something extraordinarily bad in their lives, something horrible happened, and that's why they're in our office, that's why they're getting ready to go to court to testify. And, you know, we can, um, 
we can successfully prosecute cases and we can find, uh, we can help find uh, and bring evidence and hold people accountable for bad behavior or for their criminal activity. Uh, but we can't make the victims whole and we can't make everything right. Uh, the best we can do is seek justice for the victim, um, for the community, but the victims continue to live on with whatever trauma they've experienced. And it's hard to, to know that you can't fix that. And so that's, it's a day-to-day -day challenge. We can successfully prosecute, but it's not gonna be okay in the end for most of our victims because they have to live on with that trauma. So that's the challenge for me and all of our prosecutors, um, knowing that we can do our best and we still can't, we still can't make the victim whole. And that, the, um, that does wear on our, our staff. Uh, my biggest challenge is convincing my clients that I truly care about them and that I'm going to do everything within my power to help them. Uh, as a public defender, your clients are largely poor people. They are largely, in, in this county, they're usually people who don't look like me, who don't sound like me, and they are in a bad position and in comes some middle-aged, bald, white guy in a suit they've never met, uh, who's telling them, look, you know, I am the one who's going to fight for you through this. And uh, a lot of times, my clients initially are very, very skeptical. You know, wh why would this person, you know, do what he's saying? Um, and that really never goes away, so you sort of go through it with every new client you get. Um, but as long as you just persevere, as long as you show your client that you are working on their behalf and that you're listening to them, um, you can do it. But that's, that's one of the hardest things. Well, I guess the, the challenge that I've experienced and observed, and this is not something that's specific to my current role as the Deputy Attorney General with the state, but based on having worked in Monterey County and San Francisco, is I think um, within the legal profession we struggle with having enough attorneys um, serving rural communities um, such as Monterey County, enough um, attorneys who are willing um, to focus their careers on uh, you know, serving the public or working in legal aid, providing free legal services. Um, we struggle with having enough attorneys um, who speak Spanish, who have um, an understanding of immigration law, um, of, of um, the criminal law, and I've seen that um, throughout the state, whether it's um, a county somewhere in the Central Valley or here um, on the Central Coast, uh, organizations like CRLA, we, we sometimes struggle to find an attorney who's willing to come to Salinas or willing to work in Delano or in El Centro down by the border. And so um, when we have so many clients who need help um, and we don't have enough attorneys, it creates um, a, a real struggle because the attorneys who are working in these offices have more cases than, than they can handle um, or, that, or that they would ideally handle. And, and um, you know, the legal profession is such um, a, a rich career path um, that I would certainly um, like to see more people from Monterey County, more students like yourselves, considering the legal profession because um, we, we do have an, you know, just a, a, such a substantial need to improve access to justice by having more um, folks in our, in our communities um, you know, complete their educations and take the necessary career steps to 
join the legal community in whatever role that might be, whether it's you know law enforcement officer or in legal services or the public defender's office or the DA's office and so forth. So we just need uh, more attorneys and other legal professionals with a sort of cultural understanding and the language capacity um, to, to provide excellent service. Over the past 10 years or so, there's been um, some really sweeping uh, legislative changes, particularly the public safety realignment and the juvenile justice realignment, which you know, put a lot, it, it directly affected um, the probation department and how we um, provide services to the court, the public, um, and our clients. So it's been challenging in the sense that, you know, you think you have a good sense of what the law is and, and how it's to be applied, and then it, it changes 180 degrees. Um, so we're constantly relearning and trying to decipher and on a side note, th these laws are not particularly well written, in my opinion, <laughs> so <laughs> they're hard to follow, and so there's a lot of interpretation. Um, but over the past two years, I think uh, dealing with the pandemic, particularly in the juvenile institutions, um, putting safety protocols and, uh, you know, recognizing that the youth in our, in our custody and our care, um, you know, we've limited visitations because you know we had to put all these protocols into, into place so it's been a, a real challenge keeping the kids safe and our staff safe um, but hopefully we're coming out the other end of that thank you for answering my question Good morning, panel members. My name is Ixel Lopez Magana. I'm from North Salinas High School. And my question for you is, do you really like your job and why? Is this any challenge? Thank you. That's, that's a great question. Um, and I have to tell you that I have the best job in the world. Do you believe me? It's true, I do have the best job in the world. Um, I'm gonna, the funny thing is, when I come out and start my job every morning, everyone stands up. I'm not quite sure why that happens. Um, but it isn't because everyone stands up. The reason that I have what I think is the best job in the world is because I get to do what I think is right and is just and is honest every day. I won't say that it's easy to come up with the right, honest, and just decision every day, but at the end of the day, when I have finished, I know that I've done my very best. I know that I have listened to everyone that has been in front of me. Everyone has had an opportunity to speak. And as I say, I can go to bed knowing that I've done really what I think is right. I haven't been influenced by anyone. I've done what I think is right. And that's really something that's very valuable. So as far as the challenge, it can be a challenge because sometimes, actually many times, other people don't, don't agree with me. They say that a judge um, in making a decision makes a friend for a moment and an enemy for life because you're really deciding for one side and against another. So there is a challenge in that. You can't want to be everyone's friend. You can't want to be the favorite um, of everyone. So it is a hard job from that perspective, but um, the best job in the world. Thank you. Do I enjoy my job? Yes, I, I really still enjoy my job, even though some of the most challenging parts of my job are, you know, you're a target. When you're an elected official, when you're the sheriff, you're a, a target for a lot of people in the media. And, uh, but I still enjoy the work that I do. Uh, a lot of the things that we've accomplished, um, you know, the big challenges I think are when something happens across the United States, when you have a bad cop that does something bad somewhere that's not in Monterey County, it's, it could be out in New York or it, it could be in Michigan, wherever it is, it 
paints all cops in a bad picture. And so it's a very challenging trying to convince people through the media that we, we really do things right in Monterey County. We train the deputies, we train the officers here in Monterey County and in the state of California. We train them to be the best cops they can be. Uh, but the truth is we hire people just like you that are, we, we give everybody in this audience an opportunity be, to become a law enforcement officer and we hire people. We, we train them, we give them the best training we can possibly give them and we hold them to the highest standards. But when a cop somewhere in, in some other part of the country does something terrible that, that, that we don't teach in the academy, uh, it paints every law enforcement officer in a bad light, and it's challenging trying to convince people. And it's part of that, part of convincing people is reaching out to the community, coming to forums like this, and talking to you face to face, and and answering those questions. And um, but uh, just trying to get good, qualified uh, young men and women such as yourselves to to want to be law enforcement officers is challenging today, but. Uh, we continue to hire good quality people and and give them the best training we could possibly give them. I don't like my job. I love my job. And um, I have loved it every day that I've walked into that office. And, and it's simply because my job is to do the right thing. Uh, I have a, I have a, core sample that's engraved in my office and it says why I do what I do and it's engraved with the word justice and what most people don't understand about the DA's office is Sheriff Bernal um, any of these law enforcement agencies they can arrest someone every day and unless I decide unless my office decides that there is enough evidence to prosecute that person will never see the front doors of the courthouse. We stand between the people who are arrested in the streets and the court. And only if our office feels that there's enough information to prosecute someone for that crime will someone go in front of a judge. So we are gatekeepers, and it's very important that the prosecutors are ethical, and motivated to do the right thing and to represent victims in a way that is appropriate. So it's a joy to be able to do that. Yes, there's a challenge and it's frustrating when we can't achieve justice for victims or for the community, but um, there are a ton of wins every day. And I'm not talking about wins in terms of a guilty verdict. I'm talking about a case that gets resolved in a way that is just for the defendant, the victim, and the community. That's a win, and that's what we seek every day at the DA's office. Um, Judge Culver and DA Pacioni um, are smarter than I am, more experienced than I am, but they're wrong on this. Um, the best job is my job. Uh, it's uh, um, the best part, uh, and I say that kidding, the best part of my job is uh, my clients. Um, getting to, it's, and that's the thing that makes it so exciting, is every day you get to meet new people, you get to learn about them, you get to win their trust, you get, everybody has a story. I mean, no one, no one ends up in jail um, you know, without a story behind it. Um, and getting to know people one-on-one, -on -one, getting to help people one-on-one -on -one, um, is really the best part of my job. Um, and any challenges that come along just really pale in comparison to the satisfaction and joy I get out of um, my relationship and being able to help my clients in a very difficult position. So um, I currently, you know, I, as a deputy attorney general, I represent the state of California and I have immense pride in, in our state. It is such a beautiful and diverse state. 
Uh, we, of course, have Monterey County, which is you know, the salad bowl capital of the world, um, a major uh, uh, um, tourist destination given our like coastline and, and, and Big Sur. And, and there are so many other parts of the state that are pretty phenomenal as well, you know, whether we're talking about Silicon Valley or we're talking about um, uh, Southern California, LA. And so what I love most about my job is that when I go to work every day, I'm representing um, the interests of the state and, and protecting um, the rights and the interests of our state as a whole. And it is um, such a dynamic um, jurisdiction. It's such a, um, it's a major economy unto itself. Um, our economy is as large, if not larger, than most other countries. And we have developed um, a unique set of laws. And in some, in some respects, California, even before um, um, our federal government recognized uh, the importance of certain basic civil rights, including desegregating schools um, within the state, even before we did that nationally. And so I think California, um, we're, we're diverse. We have uh, modern day struggles and problems, um, you know, trying to figure out how to have enough housing for everybody, um, good paying jobs, a, a, a healthcare system that um, provides enough care to everyone. Um, and our state government, our legislature, and our government develops uh, solutions every day, year to year, um, trying to solve those problems. And then, as the DOJ, we are the law, the you know highest law enforcement agency in the state, and the essentially law firm that represents the state government and and defends many of those um, laws that are intended to serve. Um, the interests of our state residents. And so um, it's, it's just incredibly exciting and um, interesting. <laughs> um, if, if you're somebody who's interested in current events and, and solving a variety of social problems, you know, that's the type of work that I have to uh, wrestle with um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's, it's an incredible organization to be part of. Um, and especially if you believe in democracy, you believe in the Constitution, when you work for the government um, in some function, it's your opportunity to be in involved in that process. Well, as the chief, um, my bosses are the Superior Court judges, so what's not to love, right? <laughs> uh, um, but a as a probation officer, I think, uh, you know, I've enjoyed every position I've ever held. Um, having the opportunity to work with people who are struggling and, um, you know, try to get them to, you know, change the way that they think about things and maybe approach things a little differently and, and make a difference in their lives, it's, it's very re rewarding. And um, it's, it's very challenging as well, but really challenges are an opportunity to grow and learn. And really that's what makes you stronger is, is overcoming challenges. Thank you. Um, hello, panel. Uh, my name is Valentino Corona, and I'm from Everett Alvarez High School. And my question for you today is, uh, what challenges have you faced, and how have you overcome them? Thank you. I'm going to um, talk about challenges really, really early in my career. So when I first became a lawyer, I had no desire to be inside a courtroom. I never wanted to go to court. And you can be a lawyer without going to court. The reason I didn't want to be in a courtroom is I was afraid to speak in public. Is there anyone here that doesn't like speaking up in a group? Okay, so you all are like I was. I didn't want to speak in public. I was much more comfortable with my friends in a small group, and it scared the heck out of me to be in front of a group. Certainly a group like this was just unimaginable. And I had to get over that. Um, and the way I got over it was by, of course, 
trying to be very, very prepared before I went and spoke. And it wasn't easy. I um, was easy to prepare. It wasn't easy to always get up in front of a group. Finally, um, it became something that I did on a daily basis. But I will tell you that even a group like this, it's a challenge. It's not something that um, I don't like being the center of attention, believe it or not. And because I don't like being the center of attention, speaking in public is difficult. So for those of you who that is a challenge, know that you can get over it. I did. Thank you. I think my biggest challenge was I went from deputy sheriff to sheriff. And usually we have a rank structure. Uh, starting from the bottom, we have the deputy sheriff. And then you promote to the rank of sergeant to the rank of commander, then to the rank of chief, or, uh, captain, and then the rank of chief. And then below me, there's the under sheriff, who is my assistant, and then up to sheriff. So I went from deputy to sheriff uh, just because I was qualified to be sheriff based on my years of experience as a deputy and my certifications. Um, but that's not the normal path. And so the biggest challenge was proving to the people of Monterey County that I can do this job. And the only way I could do this job successfully was to surround myself with great people. And it, you know, after eight years, I, it took me a couple of years to find the right people, but I, I finally surrounded myself with people that were smarter than me, who have uh, been in this job for many years and had the experience necessary to run the department with me. And, um, it's it's been my biggest challenge over eight years to convince people that I can do the job and and I feel that I've I've done a great job in the last eight years and it's it's been a rewarding experience so that's the biggest challenge I think you know um, when I for in, in terms of a challenge leaving um, the DA's office to stay home with my kids I actually never thought that I would return to the workplace. I thought I would remain home with them and um, do what I was doing during that time period, which was raising my kids and working in their schools and supporting their dance and whatever else they were doing at the time. So for me, um, the challenge was actually re-entering the workplace, a uh, professional workplace, um, where we handled serious cases and um, I had left at at the highest uh, rank of a deputy DA. And, and then I returned and I returned, uh, my boss uh, brought me back to work um, at, made me vol volunteer for six months without pay. And then, um, then he, he agreed to hire me back full time at a lower wage than when I had left. And so I had to uh, relearn uh, my, my skills or refresh my skills to get up to the point where I could go into court and litigate cases um, professionally and uh, with, um, with success. And so it, just going out of the workplace and, um, and then coming back in was difficult. But also it's difficult because I'm, I'm just going to be honest, it's harder on women than it is on men. And you're not gonna, the guys aren't going to like to hear that, but the women are going to totally appreciate the fact that that's, it's a true statement. You know, we're told that we can't wear pink because it makes us look like we're, you know, weak. We're told that um, you have to be tall um, and and you have to be strong, and, and you can you can be all of those things, and you can still wear pink and you can be strong. Uh, so I would just tell the ladies out there that um, use your strengths where you have them and develop your weaknesses into strengths and. Um, don't be intimidated that you're the only female in the room because there are going to be a lot of circumstances, a lot of situations and work environments where you're going to be the only female in the room and it can feel uncomfortable, but you have to know your worth and, um, and fight, for your, for, fight for your position in the room. For the sake of time, we're going to ask our last question, and we'll move through, and every panel member uh, can, a can answer the question, and then we'll move into our next activity. Okay. Good morning, panel. My name is Estefania Gomez from North Salinas High School, and my question is, with the knowledge that you have now as you look back on your life, what advice would you give? Thank you. 
you. I know this question was asked of the Chief Justice, and it's a great question. And um, the message that I would have for myself if I were in your seat today is to stay in school, continue in school, and go to more school, but also make sure that you have good mentors. Find people out there that you know or who someone will introduce you to that um, you like what they're doing or you think that they have a position that you might want to have and talk to them. Ask them questions. Ask them to be your guide. I wouldn't have gotten to any of the jobs that I had or any of the probably graduate degrees that I um, have without having mentors, without having other people um, help me. I didn't have family members who had gone to college. I didn't have family members who had become lawyers or professionals. So I had to look elsewhere. And having those mentors outside is really important. So 100% what Judge Culver said, and I will add to that, um, have a dream, always dream about what you want to do in life. That's what I've done. I, I dreamed that I wanted to fly. I wanted to be a pilot, and I went out and I found a way to achieve that dream, and I lived that dream. I had a dream that I wanted to become a deputy sheriff. I wanted to, to patrol Monterey County, and I went out and I, I, I found that mentor. I, I found a few mentors and, and asked him about that job. I went on ride-alongs, and I learned from, you know, from the mistakes a lot of them made. I learned from those and learned from their successes and build on their successes and, and model yourself after the people you look up to, but then be yourself. But the most important thing is education and having that dream and finding a way to make that dream come true because if you can dream it you can do it and i believe i've i've followed my dreams and i still i'm 56 years old and i still have dreams that i'm going to follow and and they're challenges but if if you can dream it you can do it and I always believe that looking back i would ask more questions and i would listen more to the answers I would pay just a little bit more attention uh, to what was going on around me when I was in school and uh, in law school and in my early career. Uh, there's a lot to learn out there and you can um, increase your opportunities for success, not only in work but in your personal life by listening more and asking a lot of questions. The advice I would give my younger self is uh, believe in yourself. Um, the, one of the things I've learned throughout my life is that um, things are attainable. The people that you admire are not nearly, um, I mean, they're not superhuman. Um, any of the people up on the stage here today, I mean, you can do what they do. Um, you know, self-doubt is probably the greatest enemy to success that you can have. And part of that is, you know, not listening to people who are really, really negative. Um, if there's something that you want to do and you're of average intelligence, you can do it. It's just a matter of doing it. That's what I would say. This is kind of going to echo the prior comment, um, but I, I think probably the best advice I heard early on was in law school, um, where, where I went to listen to a judge speak, actually. Um, judge Henderson, um, the first African-American judge, I believe, appointed to the district court up in uh, San Francisco. And he said, you know, ordinary people do extraordinary things, and that's exactly what I needed to hear and because I feel very much like an ordinary person. We're all ordinary people, um, but with a bit of hard work and um, a willingness to overcome self-doubt and be fearless and try new things, you can have a really amazing career um, you know, following whatever your passion might be, whether it's law or something different. 
But um, yeah, just remember that, you know, don't let your fears get in the way. If you have a passion, if you have a desire to learn something, to try something new, go for it. And, um, you know, find individuals who will help open those doors um, for you and give it a shot. You know, I'll echo the, the last two sentiments and because, you know, looking back, you know, I was the only place I was ever comfortable was, you know, in athletics and sports. And outside of that, I was very shy. I was unsure of myself. I always second guess myself. But I, I, I need to I would tell myself to go back and trust my gut because um, how I felt about things um, usually turned out to be correct. Um, so I would just have a little more confidence in myself to, you know, to, to not stand out, but um, just give myself the ability to trust myself. And if I was going to give you any advice, it would be to um, surround yourself with positive people and positive influences. And, um, you know, this being career day, um, the number one thing that the probation department has trouble hiring people is because people cannot pass background. And it's usually because of something silly that someone's done in their past. I'm not saying that one little thing is going to uh, ruin a career, but if you surround yourself with those positive people and trust yourselves, um, good things will come. Thank you. Thank you so much to our distinguished panelists for sharing your time your stories and your perspectives. It's been very helpful. Thank you. And now I'll invite Mr. Chris Devers to announce and present the certificates to the essay and art winners. Okay, I think we have a slide for this. Okay, let's go ahead and pull the uh, slide up. I'm going to read uh, the names off the slide. I have the envelopes with the names here. Okay, our third place uh, winner. And uh, can we bring the name up and show the piece of art? This is our third place winner, Johanna Harrell from Soledad High School. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> is Joanna here in attendance? If Joanna's here, you can come up and get your gift certificate. We have a $100 uh, gift card for her. Joanna's not here. Okay, so we're going to move on. Our second place art winner. This is Amanda Rangel from Everett Alvarez High School. Amanda, come on up. You've won a $300 gift card. This is you. Amanda, would you like to say anything about your piece of art? Okay, so I didn't prepare anything, so I'm just gonna say this was. Um, it started with a sketch. Like this was the first thing I thought of when it came to union, and I'm just glad it took me to second place. Thank you. Okay. And here's your gift certificate. And you're gonna exit right off this way over here. And drum roll, and our first place art winner is, here she comes, look at that, Yarismi Baeza from King City High School, and her family is here to join her. She won $500. There you are. Give me a sec. Ah, I'm nervous. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon to everyone who were who was able to attend this special program. My name is Yaresmi Baeza, and I am a senior at King City High School. I feel honored to be here and proud to say I am the first place winner of Law Day Student Art Contest. Now to get into what the contest was about. Back to when my teacher, Robin Cohen, first mentioned about the prompt, 
uh, what does a more perfect union mean to me? I have to admit, when I first encountered the question, I really wasn't sure. I didn't really have a thought about what that meant to me. But I kept tossing the prompt around in my brain. And then one day, in my government class, I overheard a conversation of my fellow students. And my fellow student and my teacher were having a conversation about Lady Justice and who she was and what she represents. Reflecting on that conversation, I realized that Lady Justice symbolizes the idealism of what a perfect a more perfect union would be. The image of Lady Justice is what we hope for. It represents the real justice that would look like. Lady Justice would give fair, equal treatment to people who are facing the law. That is why Lady Justice is blindfolded, so she cannot be biased by appearances. So she can she is so so she can't consider how what people's wealth, power, status, and race when making judgment. The sword is what gives Lady Justice power, authority, and strength. The scales is to show how there would be, or should be, balance in our union, our country, so that we could become a more perfect union. Now moving on to what the hands image represents. I added those hands to show we need to come together. That means people of different races and backgrounds in order to become more perfect. I mean, we can't be perfect, but we'll be there someday. But uh, what the birds represent is our freedom. It's the freedom we are given that helps us be who we are or what we want to be. You might wonder why the flag is the only part of the image in color and why Lady Justice is in black and white. It is important to me to include the flag because it represents our country and it's our country that we have to work on and make it more perfect. I mean, we can't, but we still can. In working harder to make our country better, the things that Lady Justice symbolizes become more of a reality and her colors could show brighter as well. All these details show how the image in my piece reflects my thoughts about the prompt. I'd be interested to hear as well what others interpret my piece. Thank you to all who came and thank you to the judges who judge my art piece. And thanks to those who saw my art piece and those who took the time to come out and Cheer me out. Thank you. Okay, and now for our essay winners, if we could bring that slide up, starting with third place, please. This was our speech and essay contest, and let's look at third. Do we have the names of those on a slide? No? We don't have the names on a slide, okay. Good thing I have them here. Um, so we finished, uh, we had first, second, and third for essay. Uh, the prizes for those were 500 for first, 300 for second, and 100 for third. And the first person uh, that I want to recognize is our third place winner is Mark Asuncion from Palma High School. Is Mark here? Can I give it to him? He's Absolutely. Absolutely, and ask him if he wants to share any words about his essay. Mark, would you like to share any words about your essay? Mark is a friend of my son's. I didn't have any dealings with judging anything. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank my mom, because I love her very much. I'd like to thank all my friends, my family, God, my teachers, Mr. Sterrett, he's right there. Right there. Please, Mr. Sterrett, stand up. I want to have a nice round of applause. And my A-push teacher, Mr. Carnazzo, 
He taught me to put meat on the bone for all my essays, which is uh, you know, packed full of information. So thank you, Mr. Carrazo. And our second place winner in the essay uh, contest is from also from Palma High School is Matt Cortez. Okay, he's, he's declining to share about his essay and thank anybody, but we know he's greatly appreciative and he's a winner. Don't spend it all in one place. Matthew, thank you. Okay, Matthew, if you would, Matthew, if you could just go off this way because we have some things we need to take care of on that side of the stage once you exit. Thanks. Okay, now, drum roll, and our first place winner from Salinas High School. We have, and she is going to read her essay, her full essay to you all today. Uh, very proud of her piece of writing. We have Hannah Alcocer. Hello, my name is Hannah Alcaster, and today I'm going to be reading for you all my essay, A More Perfect Union. It was shackles and an ankle monitor that defined my school. Shackles and an ankle monitor was what divided the entire town of Salinas. Shackles and an ankle monitor broke apart friendships. Face tattoos and big lips drawn on a baby doll fear, strike fear in our community. But those same face tattoos and big lips drawn on the baby doll drive myself and others to push for unity and change. The beginning of our senior year at Salinas High was off to a challenging start. Within just the first three weeks of school, we had an incident where students abused and defaced a black baby doll. There was an uproar from the entire community for good reason. Like me, so many others who live in Salinas felt disappointment, confusion, and sadness over the issue. Many of those who spoke out about the baby doll reflected on how these issues are not rare occurrences in today's American society. In fact, even in our community, with all the diversity we present, there have been too many times where minorities are discriminated against. Evident in our nation, people of color have been attacked. Asian women being targeted in their workplaces unable to carry out their days without the fear that someone may hurt them, African-American men being racially profiled over an alleged counterfeit $20 bill, Mexican paleteros, ice cream men, being beaten and stolen from, Native American girls who have gone missing and their cases ignored. All of these instances are a sad and harsh reality in our world. In a more perfectly unified world, these people are protected. In a more perfect union, Asian women are not fearful of their day-to-day -day lives. Black Americans do not have to be concerned whether or not an encounter with a policeman is life-threatening. Our paleteros are not harassed as they try to make money to support their families. In a more perfect union, Native American girls receive the recognition they deserve. Following the incident, we were all left with questions. How do we guard the minorities of our community? How do we instill change? And how do we heal our town? How do we prevent other instances like the doll from ever happening again? It started with a couple of girls at Selena's High who decided that if they didn't stand up and do something about it, no one else would. The co-presidents and founders of our Cultural Awareness Club gathered others who felt compelled to make a change in our community. We offer a safe space to those who want to share their emotions and personal opinions on the doll. Interviews were conducted to get insight on the feelings of individuals about their personal experiences with racism and discrimination at our school. After months of negotiating and pondering on those same questions, we came to the conclusion that our schools are in need of their own student union a student union where multiple representatives of each community speak on behalf and support of their groups. 
A diverse student organization like this is what I envision when I think of a perfect union. An organization that instills policies that protect our diverse student body. A student union that protects our entire student body from experiences of discrimination like those of the students we interviewed. We were presented with an opportunity to have our first female African American Supreme Court justice. Now that this possibility has been made reality, our highest court of the land is more diverse and offers one more point of view that will protect women, African Americans, and mothers. Like our newly appointed court justice, Katanji Brown Jackson. This mirrors exactly what we are hoping to achieve at Salinas High, protection of our black students who were affected and traumatized by the doll. Having a diverse set of individuals work together towards a more united school is what I picture as a perfect union. In a perfect union, I see our schools mending the ties that were broken by the racist acts that took place at the beginning of the year. I see black, Asian, Latino, and white kids supporting, respecting, and uplifting one another. A perfect union is a colorful group of people making a change, healing our community, and making choices that will prevent other baby dolls from categorizing or stereotyping groups of people ever again. As a senior, I want to be able to leave a legacy that I am proud of, and that is to create a more perfect union for my community and school. I will fight to make sure our school and students are no longer defined by those shackles and ankle monitors. Thank you. Okay, pretty impressive, right? Yeah, let's stand up. Yeah, exactly. There it is. For the art winner and the essay winner and having the courage to come up and speak your mind. Okay, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, I was here to take orders, but this will be to dismiss for lunch after I'm done with the closing remarks. Um, on behalf of the entire Law Day Committee and all of the partners that have put this on, I want to thank each one of you for coming. I want to thank the teachers for making the efforts to get you here. Thank you for all of your patience. Uh, once again, uh, before everybody is excused and gets up, I just want to recognize uh, the individuals and the agencies whose hard work went into making this happen today. Um, I want to start by recognizing the Monterey County Office of Education, led by Monterey County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Deneen Gus. And I want to recognize her team, Dora Salazar from Educational Services, and Emiliano Valdez uh, from McKate uh, for the live streaming and all of the uh, AV that took place today. I want to recognize the CSUMB team, Dr. David Ricard um, from the School of Social Sciences, and Rhonda for making really all of the venue and all of this happening and bringing this into the CSUMB community. Uh, you've definitely uh, upped the game, and we thank you, uh, Dr. Reichert and uh, Rhonda. Thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Dr. Jennifer Elliman, who is with Salinas Union High School District now. Um, who was with the Monterey County Office of Ed and has had a huge hand in setting the platform uh, for this entire event. And uh, last but not least, I want to re recognize, or excuse me, before uh, last but not least, uh, Hartnell uh, College uh, Dean uh, Joy Cowden, uh, representing the Law Day Pathway, and Dr. Andrew Soto, and all of your participation in the event and uh, the Dan and Lillian King Foundation for financially sponsoring your lunch you're gonna have after this, and for the prizes uh, you saw for the essay and art winners. And I just wanna end uh, by thanking the Monterey County Superior Court judges. I want to thank our Master of Ceremonies today, the presiding Superior Court judge, Pamela Butler. Let's give her a round of applause, please. The CEO of the courts, Chris Rule. Let's give him a round of applause, please. And Norma Ramirez Zapata, who is the uh, assistant that has backed this entire process up and had a huge uh, hand in, in all of this. Let's give Norma a round of applause. <laughs> ben James, our, our PhD student who orchestrated this with uh, uh, Judge Lavarado and the Superior Court judges reaching out at all of the schools. One more round of applause for Ben James, thank you. And I want to end by thanking my dear friend and colleague. Uh, we started this five years ago, and he is the driving force behind making all of this happen, um, the Honorable 
Judge Lavarado. Judge, where are you? Lavarado? There he is in the back. Lavarado, raise your hand. We want to acknowledge you. Judge, come forward. We, we just want to say thank you on behalf of everybody in this entire room and from me to you and all of us, thank you for being the driving force behind this all. <laughs> Kayla, Anna Paulina, our students from Hartnell who helped with the questions and vetting the essay, our evaluation committee, and everybody else who was a part of this, and I hope I didn't forget anybody. Thank you all and have a wonderful lunch.